This is the city, Los Angeles, California. Geographically, the biggest in the world. And still growing. Every day, the population increases by almost a thousand. It begins to get crowded. Three million people were here ahead of them. There are all kinds, the young and the old. Those who love and those who hate, they're the kind who make work for me. I carry a badge. It was Thursday, September 15th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch at a burglary division. My partner's Bill Gannon. The boss is Captain Mack. My name's Friday. It was 7.30 a.m. We were reporting in early for another day. It got started in a hurry. A large quantity of high-velocity gelatin dynamite had been stolen from a consumer's storage magazine. We had to try and find it before somebody used it. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. want to go on. Night Watchman, Donnelly Construction Company. Yeah. This morning he flushed two men in a station wagon. When he got close, they threw something at his car. What's that? U.S. Army hand grenade. Captain Mack had told the bomb squad to meet us at the construction company supply yard located at Slauson and Florence in the southern section of the city. Civilian possession of a hand grenade is a violation of the dangerous weapons control law. Pulling the safety pin had to be the act of a desperate man or a sick mind. Either way, the incident had to be investigated. a.m. we arrived at the Donnelly Construction Company. Matt Kemper, the night watchman, met us at the company office. He pointed out the high explosives magazine that had been burglarized. Ray Murray from SID and a demolitions expert were already at the scene. Them bomb men over there, you gotta hand it to them. Nerves like solid steel. Mm. Kinda gives me the shakes. Unexploded grenade, just something I don't want to fool with. Yes, sir. Do you want to tell us what happened here? Yeah, just like I said on the phone. Around 6 a.m., I was making my last round, and I come across this car, parked right by the magazine. I didn't think much of it, but hardly a night I don't have to chase off a lover or two. Yes, sir. Then I seen there wasn't lovers at all. They was breaking into the magazine over there. Who was breaking in? Two men. But you won't have no trouble facing them. How's that, sir? Took down the license. That was the thing to do, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Do you have the number? Oh, yes. I, I wrote it down so it wouldn't get away from me. I'll run it through DMV, Joe. Right. Now, Mr. Kemper, I wonder if you could give me a description of the men. Well, young fellas they were. Must have been crazy to throw that grenade. Did you notice how they were dressed? Anything like that? Mm, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I guess I got a little rattled. Well, were they tall or short? Do you remember how they were built? Heavy or slight? No, no, sir. I just can't help you, Sergeant. But I'll think on it. And if I can pull anything up, I'll sure tell you. It'll help if you can remember. Yes, sir, I'll try. Joe, this is Gene Ellis, chief engineer on the construction project. Mr. Ellis? Sergeant Friday. Mr. Ellis, would you tell the sergeant what you told me? I just finished checking our explosives inventory. Yes, sir. We're minus eight cases. That's 400 pounds of high-velocity gelatin dynamite. You mean it's been stolen? It has to be. What's an issue on this job? You're sure? Positive. Lock on the magazine door. It's been jimmied. Looks like a pry job, Joe. 400 pounds, what's that mean in explosive strength? That's 1,640 cartridges of high-velocity stuff. One of the most powerful dynamites manufactured. Yes, sir. It had leveled two city blocks. a.m. Ray Murray and the men from the bomb squad had finished their preliminary investigation of the unexploded hand grenade. Murray filled us in while we waited in the construction company office for a report from DMV on the suspect's license number. Fortunately, the primer was damp so it wouldn't detonate. The dynamite cartridges that were stolen, what size are they? These particular ones are one and a quarter by eight inches. 250 pound case, eight cases missing. Yeah. 
Mr. Ellis, have you figured how many blasting caps are missing? I figure three containers. That's 72 caps. I hope the thieves know how to handle them. What do you mean, Ray? Extraneous electricity. Huh? These are electric blasting caps, Joe. A lot of people who don't handle explosives are unaware that unwanted electrical energy can enter a blasting circuit from the outside. Yeah. Transmission lines, straight currents, lightning, static, even radio or television transmission. You mean any radio or TV station in town could set them off? Depends on how close they get to an FM or TV transmitter. What about car radios? If they're used for transmitting, like ours, they're a decided danger. Yeah, but we can't be sure whoever took them will know that. Well, if they don't, odds are they'll have the caps and the dynamite pretty close together. Yeah. Makes whoever's got the stuff virtually a time bomb. Could go up any time. I got a hunch it's not the work of vandals. Nobody'd steal this kind of thing for resale. No legitimate concern would accept it. Probably couldn't be fenced either. Well, that leaves us an alternative, doesn't it? Whoever walked off with it intends to use it. We got just one big question. Yeah. Where and when? a.m. DMV came up with a make on the license number of the suspect station wagon. It was registered to a Samuel H. Halpern, legal the same, 7019 San Marcos Street. It was located up in the Hollywood Hills. 9.10 a.m. We arrived at Halpern's address. We missed him by 10 minutes. His wife told us he was an insurance adjuster and had just left for his office on Wilshire Boulevard. He was not driving the station wagon. According to Mrs. Halpern, they had traded it in on a new car over a month ago. Furthermore, she assured us her husband had been home with her all last night. She furnished us with the name of the car dealer to whom they had sold their station wagon. Peterson Motors. It was on Ventura Boulevard in Van Nuys. We left the Halpern residence and took the freeway out to Van Nuys to Peterson Motors to check out the station wagon used in the burglary. 9.35 a.m. Charlie, this is Fred. That blue 61 Comet station wagon we took in trade last month, licensed JMI 663. Yeah, what's with it? Okay, okay, let me write it down. Albert Amory, 9025 Pointel Street. Right. Okay, thanks, Charlie. They just mailed the new owner's pink slip up to Sacramento. That's okay, sir. We have it. Oh, you have? Thanks very much, sir. Sounds like you're in a hurry. We are. a.m. We drove over to 9025 Pointel Street. From the sidewalk, we could look down a short driveway into the garage. It was empty. Are you Albert Amory? What? Is your name Albert Amory? Al Amory, that's right. What's the problem? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Look, I just woke up. I'm just a little foggy. Come on in. I guess the place is kind of a mess. The wife usually runs a vacuum around before she goes to work in the morning. Unless I'm asleep. You work nights, do you? Yeah, I'm a bartender. A place called the Jade Pagoda down in New Chinatown. What kind of work does your wife do? She's a checker in a supermarket. Look, there's something about her? Something happened to her? No, not that we know of. Well, look, let's have it, huh? I mean, no Mickey Mouse around. Just laid out straight and simple. You own a station wagon license number JMI-663? Does it have something to do with my car? What happened? Was it an, an accident? Do you own the car? That's right, but I haven't seen it since 10 o'clock last night. Did you report it missing? No, but I was mad enough to do it last night. Why didn't you report your car missing, Mr. Amory? I figured the guy'd have it back this morning. What guy? It's a fellow who hangs around the pagoda, Siggy. What's his full name? I never heard it. Everybody just calls him Siggy. Do you know where he lives? No. How about where he works? No. Are you in the habit of loaning your car to somebody you don't even know? Look, I know him. He's a regular. There's a whole crowd of them. You ever been arrested? No. There was a burglary last night. Two men. License number and description fits your station wagon. You figure Siggy was one of them? Well, that kind of looks that way, doesn't it? You any idea who the other man was? No, I don't. This Siggy. Usually come in your place every day? As a rule, yeah. But tell you the truth, I don't care if he never comes in again. Well, now, that's the big difference. Huh? We do. Amory described Siggy as being Caucasian, slender build, fair complexion, about 25 years old, no distinguishing marks or scars. It still wasn't much to go on. Bill phoned R&I and checked the moniker file. There were five Siggies listed. None of them fitted the description. Bill also checked out Al Amory. He was clean. 10.45 a.m. We drove downtown to Central City, up North Broadway to New Chinatown. The Jade Pagoda was located in the middle of the block on Ling Ji Way. 
We picked out a booth in the back of the room and sat down to wait for the suspect, known only as Siggy. 1.55 p.m. We'd been waiting for over three hours. Still no sign of him. We continued to wait. Al Amory relieved the day man. The suspect had failed to show. 4 p.m. Fellow standing over there, end of the bar. Yeah, what about him? Name's Grove. Might be able to tell you where Siggy is. How do you figure? I saw Siggy loan him some money last night. Your name, Grove? That's right. Police officer, I'd like to talk to you. What for? You mind stepping over here for a minute? I haven't done anything. Then you got nothing to worry about, have you? You mind if I smoke? Don't be cute. What's your full name? Grove. Nelson P. Grove. We're looking for a friend of yours. Oh, yeah? Who's that? Siggy. Siggy. Now, come on, mister. We're not here to pass the time of day with you. You know who we mean. You hang around here all the time. So does he. Last night, you got some money from him. Oh, Siggy. I tapped him for a buck. That's how well I know the guy. Siggy. Is that a nickname? Yeah, I think his name is Chapman. Donald Chapman. Something like that. Where does he live? Couldn't say. I don't know him that well. I'll call it in, Joe. Seems like a decent enough guy. Sure hope he ain't done nothing bad. Depends on how quick we get to him. 4.10 p.m. Mr. Grove, I'll leave you one of our cards. If you think of anything else, give us a call, will you? Joe, looks like we struck oil. Donald Chapman, age 31, 662 Tamarack Street, North Hollywood. Fits the description. Out on bail. For what? He's waiting trial for ADW. Yeah, go on. Involved in a traffic accident, Sunset and La Brea. Locked bumpers with another car. Minor damage. Sounds a little psycho. Yeah. The other driver, man, named Leroy Wilson. Well, what about him? Well, this Chapman jumped out of his car and shot Wilson in the arm. Twenty-two caliber revolver. Why? Because of the accident? Not according to the report. Chapman gave another reason. What's that? Wilson's a Negro. <laughs> Thursday, September 15th, 5 p.m. We had to move fast. We were reasonably sure that 400 pounds of dynamite were in the hands of a man who had already committed an irrational assault with a deadly weapon. If he was the same man, we figured he wouldn't hesitate to use the dynamite. Donald Chapman's address was an apartment in the rear of a single residence on a quiet street. The property was owned by a Mrs. Anna Logan. She told us Chapman was a peculiar person, but very quiet. She didn't have a pass key. She didn't know if he was in or not. There was a car in the garage. The license number confirmed it was the station wagon used in the burglary at the construction company. The car was empty as far as we could tell. It's all here. Caps, too. Yeah. I haven't touched it. I figure we better let the bomb squad check it. Right. 
I'll call the office. I wouldn't use the car radio. Five forty-five p.m. Bill called Captain Mack and filled him in. The bomb squad was immediately notified. DA's office is sending somebody over to advise us of legalities. Yeah. Cruiser units working the block trying to clear everybody out. Well, that'll tear it, but there's nothing else we can do. You know the minute Chapman hits the neighborhood, it'll get hanky. Captain said he'd caution all of our people not to use radio transmitters. Chapman's description, what about broadcast? Went on the air five minutes ago to all units. Phil Mastui in DA's office. How are you? This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We seem to have a legal problem here. Murray thinks the dynamite ought to be moved out. That's right. Sergeant, you know that evidence can be legally removed only by permission of the owner, incident to an arrest, or by authority of a search warrant. Joe? Are the caps in the closet, too? That's right. What about just removing those? Well, we discussed that. Your case could go out the window. It could contaminate the evidence. In a way, we're almost as bad off. Phil, what about the people living in this block? Trying to clear them out going to take time. You know the right radio frequency could take out this entire block. It's your case, Sergeant. Get them out of here. the cases of dynamite we're missing? Eight, 400 pounds. Why? We're not out of the woods yet. Well, how's that? I checked the caps when I took them out to the truck. Some of those are missing. Yeah. And you haven't got eight cases. Well, what do you mean? 